and welcome everyone to our podcast series, Money Matters, on money, banking and central banking by the Institute of International Monetary Research. The purpose of the Institute is to demonstrate and bring to public attention the strong relationship between the quantity of money on the one hand and the levels of national income and inflation on the other. I am Damien Padner, Director of the Institute, and today my guest is Julian Jessup. Julian is an independent economist with 35 years of experience gained in the public sector, the city and consultancy, including stints at HM Treasury, HSBC, Standard Chartered Bank and Capital Economics. He now works mainly with think tanks and educational charities, notably the Institute of Economic Affairs, and is a regular commentator in the media. Julian, welcome and thank you for being with us today. That's great. Thank you, Damien. So today we're going to discuss the Bank of England. Um, Yesterday, they revealed a very much needed pause after 14 consecutive rate hikes and kept the bank rate at 5.25%, something we at the Institute who keep a close eye on the money supply have been calling for. However, they did also announce an increase in gilt sales via their QT program to 100 billion over the next 12 months from 80 billion over the previous year. What are your initial thoughts, Julian, on the decision? And in your estimation, Does this signify that we've reached a peak in the current rate cycle and should we expect the next move in rates to be a cut? Hmm. Well, first of all, I I was pleased with the the decision. Um, As you say, a number of us have been arguing for some time that the the Bank of England should pause on rate increases in order to assess the impact of the substantial squeeze that's already in place. uh, And in particular, the the sharp deceleration in the growth of the, the money and credit aggregate. So, um, I think the decision was a bit later than it should have been, but it was still the still the right one. Um, it was perhaps a bit less of a surprise after the, the most recent set of inflation numbers. Um, as you know, headline inflation unexpectedly fell when it was expected to, to jump. But more importantly, core inflation, excluding food and energy, uh, dropped very sharply. I, I personally think there's too much attention paid to that number, but it's something the Bank of England follows closely. So um, it was less of a surprise perhaps than it might have been, but still a, a, a very welcome one. In terms of what happened next, um, I think it's worth stressing the, the Bank of England has still left the door open for further increases in, in interest rates if there's more evidence that underlying inflation pressures are are still strong. But um, I don't think that evidence will materialise. Actually, since the Bank of England made the decision, we've had another very important business survey, the so-called Purchasing Managers Index, that suggests that the real economy is now weakening very sharply. Um, But more importantly, as I say, the the rapid deceleration in the the money and credit aggregates mean that inflation should continue to to fall, and hopefully faster than, than most people are currently anticipating. So um, I think rates are probably now on hold. Um, I suspect that they will be on hold for an extended period, though. Um, I don't personally think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, after all, one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why inflation has been so high over the last couple of years is that monetary policy has been too loose for too long. So um, I think central banks will be wary of repeating the mistakes of, of cutting rates and leaving them too low too quickly. Um, the other factor is that if we do get cuts in interest rates anytime soon, the context is all important. And if it's because the economy is diving into a deep recession, then, then a you know, quarter of a point off, off interest rates isn't much to cheer. Um, I'd rather that we have a you know, steady economic recovery from here and interest rates basically plateauing out around these levels for some considerable period of time. Oh, yes. I mean, I think there's nothing that I wouldn't disagree with. And I, I think you're right. The would expect rates now to kind of plateau out um, this uh, table mountain uh, scenario that Hugh Pill mentioned last week um, for quite some period of time, uh, well into next year, I, I, I would forecast anyway. Um, those who follow the, the Institute will uh, be very aware of our you know, vocal uh, criticism of the Bank of England's initial stages during the early part of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, particularly the implementation of quantitative easing and the pace of interest rate hikes amid, amidst escalating inflationary pressures. As an independent economist, do you think these criticisms are justified or do you think perhaps they paint too harsh a picture of, of the bank's actions? Well, I, I think those criticisms are justified. And indeed, the I think the Bank of England itself in various ways has acknowledged that it's made big mistakes over the last few years. 
Um, it has commissioned an external review of its forecasting from the former governor of the US central bank, Ben Bernanke. So it, it recognises the need to, to bring in outsiders to have a have a look at what they're doing. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of going too far in criticising individuals here. Um, you know, as a former you know, public servant myself, I recognise how difficult these jobs are. Um, and I think we have to be very wary of criticising individuals at an independent institution like the, the central bank. And I, I'm a supporter of central bank independence, and so I don't want to be too harsh. Um, that said, I think something has gone seriously wrong. Um, I think I'll be in the camp of people who have been quite critical of the performance of both the current Bank of England governor and also, of course, Mark Carney, his, his predecessor, um, who I think was partly responsible for the, the drift away of the central bank from looking purely at monetary policy and monetary aggregates, a sort of a mission creep towards thinking about loads of other you know, potentially worthwhile things like, like China change and so on. But I think the Bank of England has lost focus over the last two years. Um, I think it's a, a huge mistake that they, they haven't paid enough attention to, to money and credit aggregates recently. Um, it's only actually in the last few monetary policy reports that I've noticed any reference at all uh, to broad money. And even then, it's just been a sort of throwaway, uh, throwaway sentence rather than something more serious. So um, I, I think there is, there is a problem. Um, it, it's partly about the people. But remember that there are nine people on the monetary policy committee so I think it's probably wrong to single out just one or two, even the governor and the deputy governor, for, for criticism. Uh, the real issue is, is I think, the lack of diversity. And by that, I don't mean what we normally think of in terms of diversity, you know, that school you went to and, and, and so on and so on. It's more about the diversity of views. Um, in the good old days of 10, 20 years ago, in the early stages of the, uh, the setting up of an independent monetary policy committee, there are always a few what you might call mavericks, what I sometimes think of as nutters of one type or another, who took a wildly different view from the rest of the committee. But it's very hard to, to point to anybody of that type over the last few years. The recent appointments to the Monetary Policy Committee have been very much, you know, safe pairs of hands that I don't, I don't think are going to rock the boat. Uh, I think that personally is the biggest single problem here. Exactly. And, and I would just point out for our listeners that we, we are a big supporter of central bank independence. But I think that with that comes a lot of accountability and maybe that's the area that we we need to look at or you know politicians um need to look at and and maybe revisit the 1998 bank of england act but that that's for another discussion um in follow up to that then um do you think the departure from the transitory inflation stance and a more proactive approach to raising interest rates could have resulted in a more moderate peak in interest rates than we're currently witnessing um well, quite possibly. I, I think the whole sort of transitory versus permanent or persistent uh, debate around inflation revealed what I think is a fundamental problem in the way that most people think about inflation. So, for example, if, if you pick up you know, any mainstream newspaper, or look at you know, the BBC or Sky, uh, when inflation goes either up or down, they pretty much say it's due to, say, energy prices rising or food price inflation, inflation falling which is at best a, a description of inflation, is not an explanation of, of, of what's actually happening. So in the early stages of the inflation surge, everybody was saying, oh, look, it, it, it's food and energy prices that are going up the most. So that's the cause of inflation, which obviously missed the bigger picture, missed the, the wood for the trees. That The reason why inflation was going up so much was that there was too much money chasing too few goods and services in the, in the classic classic way of putting the, sort of the, the monetarist perspective on inflation. Um, it just so happens that there were particular supply shocks that are having a major impact on, on food and energy, you know, not least Russia's uh, invasion of, of Ukraine. So it just so happens that those are the areas where that underlying inflation pressure showed up the most. But if it hadn't been food and energy prices, it probably would have popped up somewhere else. And indeed, that's what happened. So as there were signs of food and energy price inflation easing, other parts of inflation simply picked up to, to replace that. So what appeared to be a transitory shock due to higher food and energy prices became a more persistent problem of inflation spreading out through the rest of the, 
uh, rest of the inflation index. Now, a, a monetarist would have spotted that, but if you were doing the sort of the the, sort of the abacus economics or the sort of accounting way of looking at inflation as simply the sum of the individual parts that have gone up the most, then you would have missed that. Um, so if if the bank had been more on top of this early on, I think it would have recognised that monetary policy was was too loose uh, much sooner than it Absolutely. did, and therefore raised interest rates sooner. And, and just as importantly, it would have curtailed its programme of, of, of quantitative easing. So it isn't just about the price of money, it's also about the, the quantity of money. So we've ended up with interest rates, I agree, that are probably higher than they would otherwise have been. Um, a couple of caveats to that. Um, I wouldn't be overly critical of the Bank of England in isolation here because, of course, most other central banks have made the same mistake, uh, particularly the, the, the US Fed. Uh, and the second point is we, we probably have ended up with interest rates at a fairly sensible level anyway. I, I think probably interest rates of between 4 and and 5% is a sensible normal level, so we're only just a little bit above that. Um, so I wouldn't you know, completely slam the Bank of England here compared to other central banks. But nonetheless, the, the failure to pay enough attention to monetary aggregates has caused more pain, both in terms of, of, of higher interest rates, but also other policy mistakes that have been made along the way. Right, right. Um, we'll come on to the monetarist uh, perspective in a moment. But um, you're right, in, in, in the wake of the inflation surge since 2021, there have been very vocal chorus of voices raising concerns regarding the perceived lack of accountability. Do you advocate or would you advocate for the introduction of some form of repercussion for the governor or the deputy governor or even the MPC in scenarios where the inflation target is missed persistently or for long periods of time? And if so, what might such repercussions look like? Mm. Well, ideally, of course, we wouldn't be in this position to begin with. We, we, we'd appoint better people um, and give them better tools. So I, I probably focus more on the, the people that we appoint um, and the resources available to them, particularly the quality of forecasts done by, by Bank of England uh, staff. Um, but there, there, there is undoubtedly a problem. If you, if you appoint a, a, a duff governor, um, it's very hard to, to get rid of them. Indeed, even the, the slightest suggestion that you might do so, as Liz Truss sort of hinted at um, during her campaign for the Conservative Party leadership a year or so ago, can, can rattle the markets. Um, you know, you get prominent commentators in the media saying that, you know, sacking central bank governors is the sort of thing that a country like Turkey or, dare I say, Argentina would do. So I, I think you, you need to need to be very careful. Um, I do think, though, that the bank does need more scrutiny than it gets at the moment. Um, there, there tends to be a sort of impression that the Bank of England, because it's the independent central bank, is, is beyond criticism and, and beyond uh, scrutiny. Um, I'm quite attracted to actually what the Reserve Bank in New Zealand does. It has you know, pretty regular external reviews of its performance. Um, and I think it's much more open to external criticism than, uh, than perhaps the Bank of England has been. Uh, in particular, that the Bank of England has been extremely defensive when anybody from a sort of more monetarist uh, perspective has, has dared to criticise what they were doing. So I, I think it, it's partly about culture rather than rather than individuals. But um, I do think that you know the, the governor and perhaps, as you say, deputy governor for, for monetary policy should have shorter terms uh, than they currently do. Um, so they have to justify being reappointed uh, a bit earlier than they currently do. Uh, at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. So do you think there's a, this prevailing issue of uh, economic orthodoxy or groupthink at the Treasury or the Bank of England? Is, is that something that that really exists, do you think? I, I think it's definitely a big problem. There, there seems to be almost a revolving door in particular between the, the Treasury uh, and, the, and the Bank of England and to some extent other institutions like the Office for, for Budget Responsibility. Um, I partly understand that. I mean, if, if you're looking for somebody, if it, for example, who is very experienced in fiscal policy, it's hard to pick somebody who hasn't also worked at the at the Treasury. Uh, on monetary policy, though, I think that excuse is a, is a bit weaker. Um, I think that you can have a broad understanding of monetary policy without having worked at the, at the Treasury or, dare I say, at Goldman Sachs. Um, so there isn't enough you know, diversity of, of, of backgrounds in the... Uh, at the at the Bank of England, I'm also concerned that 
the independent members of the monetary policy committee are, are basically hand picked by the by the chancellor and there's a sort of farcical process of parliamentary approval and so on but um, the chancellor basically picks people that have been recommended to him by his own civil servants and i think that that link is a little bit uncomfortable that link between the treasury um, and the bank of england and that has caused i think a number of problems and partly mistakes of, of, of monetary policy but one reason many of us are uncomfortable with the policy of quantitative easing is effectively that is the central bank underwriting fiscal policy you know, indirectly rather than directly. And again, that, that makes the link between the Treasury and the Bank of England a little bit too close for, for comfort. Uh, on the general issue of economic orthodoxy and groupthink, I, I think that's a, that's a huge problem um, in this country. Um, you know, ninety percent of economists will say exactly the same thing on on any topic, and probably ninety percent of them are, are are going to be wrong in in, uh, in one direction or another. So I think there's not enough willingness to challenge the the consensus, and and certainly on on a group of nine people on monetary policy committee, surely you can save one or two places for people who have views that are, are far from orthodox and a long way from the, a long way from the consensus. Excellent. I agree with that as well. So. Um, coming back to the monetarist perspective, um, incorporating monetary aggregates, specifically sterling M4X, uh, to be a bit technical, into the policy decisions, do you think that could have potentially mitigated some of the high inflation rates that we experienced? And you know, why do you think that the bank seems to overlook or at least not fully acknowledge the relationship between growth rates and the quantity of money and the price level? Well, I got it, it. It's really, really odd. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that the, the money supply is the only thing that matters, but to, to pay no attention at all, it seems to be the position at the moment, is is, is just really weird. Um, I, I think there are probably a couple of factors behind it. I mean, first of all, you know, fashions change. So, you know, talking about sterling M four X or you know, sterling M three as as was the targeted measure not so long ago. Um, is widely associated with, um, for example, Margaret Thatcher, um, Sterling M3 targets. And um, and I'm about to say something a bit odd, because I include myself in this, some of the most passionate advocates of a monetarist perspective are not necessarily the most media-friendly and uh, trendy economists to be talking about these sorts of things. Um, the, the second problem is that this stuff is hard. Um, I mean, good luck trying to explain what Sterling M4X is to the... Uh, man or woman down the dog and duck or or, or on a mainstream TV program. This this is really difficult stuff. Um, it's much easier to say inflation's going up because energy prices are going up or or because, you know, blame Putin rather than explaining these sort of deeper concepts about the money supply. That said, it's not impossible. Um, I think you know, most lay people have sort of broad understanding of the idea that if there's too much money chasing too few goods and services, then that's going to cause inflation. Um, and sometimes if we can avoid focusing too much on the on you know on precise jargon of exactly how the monetary aggregates work, then actually you can make these points pretty well. Um, and I think people do understand that there is some sort of link between the quantity of money and or at least the price of money and the rate of inflation. So just focusing on other things as the bank does is clearly missing something. And I think people are maybe more receptive to those arguments now, particularly following the experience over the last couple of years. Now, the monetarist, argue, uh, monetarist argument is that changes to the money supply predominantly influence asset prices before impacting labour markets or good markets. Um, considering the marked deceleration in money growth this year, it's roughly around 0% on a three-month annualised basis um, back for July, Coupled with the soaring interest rates that we currently have, would you agree that we're going to see further reductions in property prices and other financial assets? Mm. Uh, well, predicting the UK housing market is a graveyard of, of many better forecasters than me. So um, I'm a little bit wary here. But um, I do think the most people are complacent about how far house prices in particular might fall. Um, and a couple of reasons for that. First of all, step back and think about the context so um, you can measure house prices in the UK in various different ways but they have risen by something like 75 percent over the last decade so there's been an enormous increase in uh, in in house prices and against that 
increase, a, a fall from here of say ten or or twenty percent, isn't really that 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 big a deal. It's basically just a, a correction back to more sustainable levels. Um, the, the second point, as you say, is that um, in an environment where uh, money is, is becoming much much tighter, financial conditions are, are tougher. You would expect uh, property prices in particular to fall, and there was actually a, a bit of research done by Bank of England staff um, a while ago, which suggested that a sustained one uh, percent increase in, in real interest rates uh, would be compatible with a twenty percent fall in the equilibrium level of, of house prices, um, and that seems perfectly reasonable to me. I think we are heading into a period where. You know, real interest rates will be you know, maybe one or two percent higher than they would otherwise have been. So that's certainly consistent with a fall of at least 20 percent in in house prices. Um, where I actually sometimes differ from the consensus here, though, is that I don't actually think that's a bad thing. Um, it's very odd that we spend loads of time worrying about inflation and the prices of pretty much every other goods and service. But you know, when people talk about falling house prices, it's it's considered to be a calamity um, or something to to worry about and and yes if you're if you're lucky enough to be an older person who already owns their own home and uh, perhaps is looking to sell it or, or downsize then um, that might be a problem but all the high house prices really do is is, is redistribute wealth they don't create wealth um, you know the good news for people who own houses and, and bad news for, for people that don't so I would think that a fall in house prices to to more sustainable levels, actually you know, making it easier to for people to get back onto the housing ladder, um, make, allowing transactions in the housing market to to recover, um, and easing other problems in the economy as well. I mean, we we have a big problem with labour mobility, and one of the factors there is a lack of availability of affordable housing. So, um, on the one hand, I do think house prices are going to fall more than most people anticipate. But on the other, I actually think it's a good thing rather than a bad thing. So, so a very much needed correction, really, I guess, in 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 house valuations and a slow grind downwards rather than a crash. Well, it's it's always difficult because as a sort of market monetarist, I, I tend to think that things should move more quickly than they often do because it seems obvious to me that um, house prices are far too high. So. My, my instinct would be to expect them to fall you know, more quickly than, than most people expect. So, I, you know, to go for a crash. But there always seems to be some things propping the, propping the market up. Um, so there's undoubtedly at the moment a, a big shortage of supply and a, and a lack of house building. Uh, on top of that, the first instinct of the government of the day always seems to be to, to prop up the demand side with, you know, various subsidies for first time buyers or, you know, various sort of mortgage support schemes and so on. So th- these are things that maybe prevent the market from working as as well as they would otherwise have done. So um, even actually in the last few weeks, we started to see uh, mortgage rates come down. So despite you know the, the increase in official interest rates, because the market has been revising down its expectations of where interest rates might be over, say, the next two or five years, then mortgage rates have actually been falling in terms of, say, two-year and, and five-year fixes. So that, that's taking off some of the pressure on the housing market as well. But if you look at the surveys produced by people like the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, and the, the numbers they're producing are certainly consistent with a fall, a peak-to-trough fall in house prices of about 20%. And I think that's the sort of right number to be talking about. Right, right. And, of course, this time around, it's uh, complicated further by the fact that we're going to have a general election next year as well, which... For politicians, um, they're always going to try and uh, cater to uh, gain in votes and staying in power. Oh, that that's absolutely right. As I say, if you look at you know, the, the newspaper headlines about a fall in house prices, it's always presented as bad news, uh, lower house prices, um, you know, fears of a house price crash and so on. Um, and that's very much the, the, the narrative that, that politicians will, will go with. Um, they seem to like how high house prices, and also despite all their rhetoric, they seem to dislike house building. So they, they set targets for house building from time to time, then they abandon them. And uh, we know there's a very strong NIMBY lobby against uh, building houses uh, in anybody's backyard, which of course means that there's always going to be a shortage of supply. So un- unless governments are really willing to tackle the 
the housing shortage or recognise that lower house prices might actually be a good thing. It's difficult to see the the political backdrop to all of this changing very much. Right. Um, the penultimate question. Um, do you think the UK is heading into a recession? Well, certainly there's been a big loss of momentum uh, over the, the last few months. And um, actually, the, this morning, it's Friday morning as I speak, and we, we just had a, a very weak business survey for the month of September that's certainly consistent with, with recession. Um, but I still think we will avoid one, um, and that's partly because I'm you know, more optimistic than most people seem to be about the outlook for inflation. So I think inflation will drop relatively sharply. Uh, real wages do now finally seem to seem to be recovering. Um, I think financial conditions will be a little bit better. So I, I think the economy as a whole will start to recover again by the end of the year and will avoid the, the dreaded recession. But it is worth saying that, of course, that's talking about the economy. Um, the numbers here are always averages and they, they can see a wide range of different experiences. And I think there'll be a lot of households that are going to be facing a very difficult winter if it be a recession for them. So particularly if you're coming off a, a low fixed rate mortgage over the next few months, your, so your mortgage bill is going to jump. And there are also a lot of people who are going to be facing higher energy bills as well. So even though the headline cost of energy might be lower, um, the government is withdrawing some of the support it's providing to, to lower income households. So there's going to be a significant minority of households who, who will be experiencing what for them is going to be a recession uh, over the next six months or so. But the economy as a whole, I think, will, will dodge one, helped by lower inflation, uh, easing financial conditions and, and still fairly tight labour market. Okay. And the final question, um, as a member of the newly formed Growth Commission initiated by Liz Truss, could you provide our listeners with insight into the Commission's objectives and the outcomes you hope to achieve through this initiative? Well, I think the Growth Commission is a really exciting initiative. It's a group of international economists and specialists in other areas, particularly trade policy and regulation that, as you say, was brought together by Liz Truss uh, in order to continue on sort of the big themes of her all too short premiership, which is a renewed focus on the importance of, of, of economic growth. Um, I think growth has sort of slipped down the, the policy agenda over the last several years. Uh, and actually, many policies have been adopted that are actually um, unhelpful for, for growth. But we do know that strong economic growth is really important, um, not just for for raising living standards, but also for increasing the tax base that we can then use to, to finance the, the public services that we all are, are going to be needing. So part of the purpose of the Growth Commission is simply to sort of increase the emphasis again on, on growth. In terms of how we're going to do that, I mean, a number of different um, programmes within, uh, within this project. Uh, but two things in particular. One is that we're going to be doing more of something of what's known as dynamic modelling. Um, which is looking at the sort of the full impacts of policy changes, whether that's tax changes or changes in regulation on the economy. Um, at the moment, we tend to look only at the, the direct impact. So if, for example, uh, the government is looking at the effect of uh, raising corporation tax, it will tend just to, to look at the increased revenue it might get from that tax over the next couple of years without thinking about the longer term implications. But we know, for example, that corporation tax is a particularly bad tax, uh, which discourages investment, it tends to raise inflation and reduce job creation. So the purpose of the dynamic modelling that we will be doing is to look at the sort of the broader, longer term effects of tax changes and other policy measures on the economy and the public finances. Uh, and the other important thing about the Growth Commission is its international perspective. Um, it's worth stressing that growth and, and productivity ha has slowed across most of the Western world over the last couple of decades, uh, particularly since the global financial crisis. So this isn't just a problem that the, the UK is, is wrestling with, uh, which means the solutions are probably not going to be UK specific either. So we wanted to bring in people from, from North America, South America, Asia to give their perspectives too, and particularly to discuss you know, what seems to be working rather better in other countries like the fast growing economies in Asia and indeed the US itself. So overall, the, the Growth Commission is a sort of attempt to raise the profile of growth in discussions about policy. 
um, to look at the sort of some of the dynamic effects of policy changes and the impact on incentives, and as I say, to bring together the international experience of a wide range of, of specialists from from different countries. Thank you, Julian. It's interesting to hear about the Growth Commission. I genuinely wish you and the others there all the very best. You certainly have your work cut out. As always, it's been a pleasure to speak to you and get your thoughts and opinions on the Bank of England and its recent policy actions. Hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.